Of all the constellations in the Northern Hemisphere, I imagine the one we're most familiar with is Ursa Major, the Great Bear, or as most of us know it, the Big Dipper. It's one of the most important constellations because its two front stars always point to the North Star, which for centuries sailors used to get their direction and navigate the sea. Those two stars in the Big Dipper are called the pointers. The Bible also had pointers who guided people to the star. That's how Christ is described in one of the Bible's oldest messianic prophecies. Numbers 24 verse 17 speaks of a star that will come forth from Jacob. And as we read through the Gospel of John, we see a number of pointers, people who bore witness to Jesus. In chapter 4, there is the woman of Samaria. In chapter 9, there is the witness of the blind man. In chapter 12, there is the crowds. But in chapter 1, is the first to point to Jesus as the Christ, John the Baptist. He declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is uh, those wonderful words, behold the Lamb, that kindled a flame in the heart of John the Apostle so that he turned and followed him. And that's our passage this morning. John has finished his prologue, the first 18 verses, and in it, he introduced the, the main person, the main figure of the gospel, and that's Christ, as the eternal word made flesh. He also introduced John, John the Baptist, and his mission, verse 7. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Now the apostle fills out that uh, testimony by recalling an occasion when an official delegation from Jerusalem went out into the desert to ask John, who are you? The question was asked not only because of John's extraordinary activity, but also because of the, the times in which he lived. John appeared suddenly. And he appeared in a day of great expectation. Less than a century before, in 63 BC, the last Jewish rulers, the Hasmonean dynasty, had fallen and the land of Israel had been incorporated into the Roman Empire. That loss of freedom and the yoke of Rome helped produce among the Jews a revival of the ancient hope of the Messiah, the king of the line of David. It also resulted in the appearance of a number of false messiahs who had followings and produced a lot of civil unrest. Josephus speaks of them. In fact, in Acts chapter 5, Gamaliel talked about some of them, some of these incidences. So when John began his ministry, people wondered who it was out there in the desert dressed in such strange clothes like the prophet Elijah and preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so we read that a group of priests and Levites were sent from Jerusalem, probably by the Sanhedrin, to ask him, who are you? The Sanhedrin was the, the ruling body in Jerusalem controlled by the, the high priest's family. Uh, and naturally, their envoys were priests and Levites who ministered in the temple. John the Baptist was a Levite. He was the son of a priest. And that may have contributed to his popularity and the suspicion that he was the Messiah. Some did expect at that time a priestly Messiah. But John rejected that immediately. I am not the Christ, he said. And so they asked, are you Elijah? He certainly looks like him. 
with his camel hair shirt and his leather belt. The prophet Malachi said that God would send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Some 400 years had passed since that prophecy, and now suddenly, unexpectedly, out in the desert is this man dressed like Elijah preaching. And so they wondered, are you Elijah? He's out there preaching repentance and the kingdom of God coming. And he responded, I am not. Then they asked, are you the prophet? And that's a reference to Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where Moses prophesied that God would raise up a prophet like him among them. So are you that man? But he denied that too. Well, this was all pretty frustrating. Members of the committee knew that they, they couldn't return to Jerusalem with just a series of denials. Uh, they knew John was somebody, that he was an important person, but they'd run out of ideas. And so they asked him straight up to identify himself. What do you say about yourself? And John answered that he was a voice. A voice prophesied in Isaiah 40, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. John's uh, significance was not in himself, not in his person, but in his ministry, in his function. He was a voice, and that's all. But a voice that announced the coming of Jesus the Messiah, and they were to look for him. Just as those ancient mariners looked for the North Star to, to guide them through dark nights on the sea and and. and did that by following the pointers. The, the pointers directed them to the star, and John was saying, don't fix your attention on me. Look to where I point. I'm not the star. I, I, I'm just a voice. It, it is the message, not the messenger, that is important. John was like a herald in ancient times who who traveled out in front of the king, who preceded him and drew attention to the king and announced his visit to a, a village or a town and told the people to, to get ready for the arrival of the king and prepare the way for him. Literally, literally to build a road for him. And in ancient times, roads were rough. They were not always paved like ours and... Uh, were especially rough in the wilderness. Years ago, my wife and I were on the island of Crete. She was pregnant with our first daughter when we rented a car with some friends and we drove from the north coast down to the south, to the southern coast, to Fair Havens, which is in Acts 27. Paul, on his way to Rome, stopped off there. In some places, the road was so uneven with potholes and gullies that uh, I worried Jeanette would uh, go into labor, really. From the, the jolting and the bouncing, it was, I'd never experienced anything like that. So the, the, the going was very slow, but it was, uh, it was a rough ride. And that's the kind of, of road imagined by Isaiah that the king's subjects would go out and repair that road. They would fill it in, they would raise it, they would level it, they would pave it, they would make the rough smooth. They prepared a highway for him through the desert. And by application, John was saying, do that in your heart. It's rough, it's uneven. Your heart is a desert full of obstacles, full of sin. Prepare your heart to meet the king. But he, John, wasn't the king. He was no more than a pointer. He was a voice crying in the wilderness, and they needed to listen to him. He's not important, but his message is. Now, there were some Pharisees in the delegation, probably also members of the Sanhedrin, and they had a question. 
Why are you out here baptizing? If you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the prophet, on what authority are you doing what you're doing? The Pharisees were, were men who were concerned about purity, uh, ceremonial purity. They were very concerned about the rituals of the law and observing those rituals in minute detail. Now, that, that was not improper. That was proper because the law was to be kept in all of its facets perfectly and completely. And they were so concerned about that that, the, that they built up a whole system of traditions. They're not biblical. They were designed to protect the Bible, protect the law and all of its rules. And so they consider these traditions something like a fence built around the law to protect it. These men were different from the, the Sadducees who operated in the temple. The Pharisees were men of the synagogue. And they were rabbis. They were the teachers of the people and influential men. And they were concerned about John's baptism, especially because he was baptizing Jews. Now, baptism was not unusual. They saw a lot of baptism. When Gentiles converted to Judaism, they were baptized. It signified the removal of the pollution of their previous life. But baptizing Jews was very unusual. It suggested there was something wrong with them, that, that they were sinners like the Gentiles. So these Pharisees wanted to know where John got his authority to do such a thing. He wasn't a Pharisee, he wasn't a Sadducee, he, he wasn't educated in their schools, he wasn't part of their denomination, he wasn't ordained. What was his authority? John knew his authority. His authority was from God, and he will say that later. He says that in verse 33, that God sent him to baptize. But here he responds by, by pointing them to the one whose way he was preparing. His response was to point them to Jesus the Messiah. That, that's where his authority was, in the one who was coming in the one whose way he was preparing. I baptize in water, he said, but among you stands one you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. In other words, don't wonder about me. Look to him. He's hidden among you. His appearance, though, would soon happen. And that would establish John's authority. So again, his baptism and, and preaching were all about pointing to Jesus, with whom John was not worthy to be compared. He was not even worthy to untie his shoes. And that statement would have resonated with these Pharisees, because among them, a student was expected to do for a rabbi what a slave would do. So these rabbis would have students that assisted them, followed them, learned from them, and they'd serve them. They served them in many different ways, except taking off their shoes. But John said it would be a privilege to do that. His rank is so high above that of any man, slave work for him was a great privilege the greatest privilege. The Lord's greatness is explained in verse 29 when the next day John saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Modern Christians are so familiar with that statement that they can miss the significance of John's words. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. But John didn't identify him with any of those titles. He didn't call him the star of Numbers 24 or the light. He didn't say, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah. He might have used any of those names instead of saying, behold, the lion. He says, behold, the lamb. This one whose sandal John was not worthy to untie, 
was a lamb. And to a sin-conscious Israelite, that would mean only one thing, that he, this one, was destined to be a sacrifice. It seems John had a particular lamb, a particular sacrifice in mind as uh, the, the type or the illustration, the picture of Christ. A lamb was offered twice daily in the temple, morning and evening. Now, that might have been his meaning. Or the Passover lamb. That's a good suggestion because Paul himself called Christ our Passover in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. It may really have been all of those and every uh, offering in the sacrificial system because in a sense they all prefigure Christ and look forward to him as the ultimate sacrifice for sinners. But since John's mission is the voice in fulfillment of Isaiah 40, it's likely that John saw Jesus as the lamb of Isaiah 53, verse 7, who was led to slaughter, on whom God caused the iniquity of us to fall. John recognized him as the lamb, God's lamb, and said, he takes away the sin of the world. He's the supreme sacrifice, the only one that truly, ultimately takes away sin. And the world desperately needs him. All have sinned, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. There are no exceptions except the Lord himself. We're all sinners. Sin is the universal problem. Mankind, womankind is guilty and helpless. We cannot remove the guilt of sin. We cannot remove the stain of sin. Top lady in his great hymn, Rock of Ages, put it so well. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. All of our deeds, all of our ceremonies, all of our emotional output, whatever it may be, won't take away one sin. Well, that's got to be the Lord alone who does it, and that's what he does through his lamb, through the sacrifice, the substitute who took our place in judgment and suffered the penalty in our place. He took away our sin. He took away our guilt. He did it. In fact, John said he takes away the sin of the world. And that shows the, the vastness of God's grace. It is worldwide in its design and saving in its accomplishment. Christ was the lamb, the sacrifice for the world without distinction of race, religion, or culture. In other words, this, this Jewish Messiah was not just the savior of the Jew, but of the Gentile as well. That's the meaning of this expression, the world. It doesn't mean, as some suppose, all men without exception, and that the, in the sense that every individual who has ever lived or who is alive or ever will live is saved in this sense, has all of his or her sins taken away. We know that cannot be the meaning since people die every day unatoned and unforgiven. Obviously, not everyone's sin has been taken away. So John was not thinking of universal salvation or even uh, some universal atonement in a hypothetical sense, a, a general provision that is conditioned on the sinner's faith. And that if that faith fails, if that faith is not exercised, then the atonement is not a success. It fails as well. The atonement is not dependent upon the sinner. The atonement is not dependent upon what we do. It's dependent upon Christ. And what John saw in Christ is that he is the actual Savior. No one, not, not one who merely provides the possibility of salvation, 
but the one who actually accomplished it. And you study the atonement, you study the death of Christ, and, and you will see that it is something that accomplishes its end. And he saw in Christ, the one who actually removes sin by his sacrifice. It's the blood of Christ that cleanses us. Salvation, redemption was accomplished at the cross. Sin was dealt with there. Salvation is obviously applied later in each generation as by God's grace the elect believe and they're brought to saving knowledge. But sin was punished and taken away at the cross. The world loves its sin. And it will never give it up, not unless it's taken away. And that is accomplished only through the power of the Savior, the power of the Lamb, the power of the cross. So what John was doing in this statement in verse 29 is define the nature of God's people. It is the world. Without distinction of race or nationality, it is all kinds of people. And John makes that clear as in this gospel, John the Apostle, as the gospel unfolds in chapter 4, for example. Christ is the Savior of the Samaritans. They call him the Savior of the world. We're included in this great work of this Jewish Messiah, they understood. In chapter 12, the Greeks came seeking him, signaling that he is the Savior of the Gentiles as well as the Jews Christ came to reclaim the world by saving all types, all kinds of people, representatives of every nation, every tongue, every tribe, until all the nations are reconciled to him. The Lord's appeal is worldwide. So our mission as his representatives is worldwide. We offer the gospel to all without exception, with the confidence that those for whom Christ died will believe. If you're here without Christ, but you're troubled by your sin, or not troubled, that's really the very worst condition to be in. Know this, that sin is deadly, but Christ died so that all who believe in him would be rescued from it. So look to him. Trust in him. And you will find when you do that, that he is the lamb that God provided for you personally for your atonement and forgiveness. That's what John told, John told people to do. He, he pointed them to Christ. He said, behold the lamb of God. And that's what we're to tell people to do. We too are pointers. James Boyce told about an Englishman named Douglas Thornton, who was being sent off at a railway station in Egypt. With some difficulty, his friend found him an empty compartment on the train. He could just relax, and not be bothered by this crowded train. An empty compartment, Thornton exclaimed. Why, man, I want to fish. And so he moved into a crowded compartment and he gave the gospel to the Egyptians. Well, later he was exploring the Great Pyramid on the outskirts of Cairo. And then while he was doing that, Thornton evangelized his guide while they were calling up a narrow passage. And he was behind the guide and giving the gospel. And it was a perfect situation for evangelism. The guide had nowhere to escape. Well, I, I know that because I've seen that in that very pyramid. I've been there. I know I've told this story before, but when you enter that pyramid, you, uh, you initially step into a large vault, which is kind of comforting and it's tall and it's large, but the passage then leads to this... Um, very narrow passage that goes up into the center part of the pyramid and into the burial chamber. Well, I was with this group and I did that, but I probably didn't take five steps into this chamber when this thought goes through my mind, claustrophobia. 
I said, I have claustrophobia, don't I? Yes, I do. And I had people in front of me. I had people behind me. I had tons of stone all around me, above me, beneath, beneath me. There was no escape. And so what I did was I, I panicked. Well, in order to get my mind off the situation, I sang a hymn. And I sang it as loud as I could. A mighty fortress. It seemed like the proper place to sing about a fortress. And so I sang it until I finally tumbled into the burial chamber. And I wasn't trying to evangelize. I wasn't even trying to edify. And I certainly didn't. I was just trying to keep my sanity. But because of that, I can admire Mr. Thornton for his presence of mind and taking every opportunity to point people to the Lamb. Even in that very odd place. Well, that's what John did. Notice also when it was that John said, Behold the Lamb. It was when he saw Jesus coming to him. Throughout this gospel, the Lord is presented in that way. He's presented as the coming one. He came to his own, even though his own did not receive him. He came into a dark world, even though the world loves darkness rather than the light. He is the God who loves sinners and comes to them, who takes the initiative, who, who makes the first move and draws us to himself. That's, that's the nature of God's love. It takes the initiative. That's the nature of grace. It is active. Now, verse 30, John, we're having some problems up here. In verse 30, John affirms that Jesus is the one who had uh, been, he had been announcing the, uh, the coming one, the one who is greater than he and existed before him from all eternity. But John calls him a man, you'll notice, using a word that means male. So not just the generic man, but this is a male. And I think that's significant. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is, uh, has higher rank than I. This gospel is about... Jesus being the eternal Son of God. That's the great theme of the Gospel of John. In fact, the passage ends with that confession in verse 34. But it, it, it never loses sight of this fact, and it's an essential fact in understanding the Gospel and in understanding the work of, of Christ. Never loses sight of the fact that Jesus was a genuine man, a true human being. That's how he entered time and space and history. And it was essential that he be a man in order to be the savior of the world. Only a human person could represent us and be our substitute. And in order to understand the work of Christ and the, understand how salvation occurs, we must understand substitution. He stood in our place. He stood on our place in death, in judgment. And only a, a male human could do that and be what is called the last Adam. That's how Paul describes him, meaning the one who took, who, who undid the ruin that Adam brought on this race through his sin. Through his act of righteousness, Christ restored the race. But to do that, he had to be like Adam. He had to be a man. Well, John learned that Jesus is the person that would do that at his baptism, which occurred earlier. He said in verse 31, I did not recognize him. Now, he didn't mean by that that he didn't know who Jesus was. He did. Uh, he was his cousin. He meant that until then, until this moment, until the baptism, he did not know that Jesus was the one whose coming he was expecting and whose coming he was announcing. But at the baptism, he explains in verse 32, he saw 
the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained on him. That's when John knew that Jesus is the Messiah. When that happened, John heard a voice from heaven. This is what confirmed it to him. God spoke to him and said, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit, which meant the one who would establish the new covenant in his blood. That covenant was promised in the Old Testament. It's promised in Jeremiah 31. It's promised in Ezekiel 36. When God said that he would make his people a new creation, he would give them uh, a new heart. He would... He would uh, anoint them with the Holy Spirit and put that law of Moses within their hearts. It's a whole new change of, of dispensation and the way God would be working with his people. Well, that began on Pentecost when God poured out his spirit on the church to begin a new age that will have its fulfillment when all Israel is saved. Well, that's the salvation of the world, Jew and Gentile alike. But it was at that moment, at the, the baptism, when God the Father spoke out of heaven, and that John realized Jesus was the coming one, the Messiah. God declared it so and demonstrated demonstrated it. So in verse 34, John gave his firm confession. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. This man is also God, the Son of God. Very God of very God, as the old confession puts it. He must be he could only be a sufficient Savior if, as a man, he's also God. Only in that way could his death have infinite value and take away the sin of the world. And, for that matter, an infinite number of worlds and an infinite number of sins. He is sufficient for everything. There's no limit to the sufficiency and the power of his death and his sacrifice for us. Now, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, that, that should be the greatest of comforts to you. Your salvation is a completed work. There's nothing more for you to do. It's all been done and done successfully and completely at the cross. There, to use Old Testament promises, he separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. Cast them behind his back. Cast them into the depths of the sea. We are absolutely and forever forgiven and secure in Christ, which should give a saint, a believer in Jesus Christ, stability in the Christian life. Stability in life and confidence. Paul wrote, in Romans 8, verse 39, that nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All of that is the ground for, a, for joy in life and a life of glad service to the Lord. Whenever we, we waver in that, and we do, our hearts get weighed down with, uh, with care and worry, with doubt, with coldness of heart. But when that happens and when we become like that, we need to look at Christ. We need to behold the Lamb. When we have doubts about things, behold the Lamb. It's the knowledge of Him and God's free and sovereign grace that instills gratitude in the heart and makes hearts burn for Him. So we always need to behold the Lamb. Now we're looking at the New Year's coming up in a few days. And so consider this a New Year's sermon. And consider that the exhortation for the New Year. Behold the Lamb. Make that your object and your effort to, 
Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. That's what the author tells us we need to do to run the race properly. And here we can use this expression, behold the Lamb. Continually behold Him. Consider Him. These words, behold the Lamb, call to mind, the, at least in my mind they do. Genesis 22, when... God tested Abraham, told him to take his son, his only son whom he loved, to Mount Moriah. And there he was to offer him up as a whole burnt offering. It was the greatest test of faith that Abraham faced, I think, than any mortal could, could face. And Abraham obeyed. But as they got near the place, you remember, Isaac became aware of something. There was no animal for the sacrifice. He said to Abraham, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Maybe he was beginning to suspect something. Abraham answered with a hopeful and prophetic statement, God will pro provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And they walked on. Later, after the angel stopped Abraham's hand from that terrible deed, there was a ram caught in the bush nearby that God provided for the burnt offering. But it wasn't that lamb that Abraham spoke of prophetically. That would come later when God offered up his own son, the son of God, to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What Abraham was not allowed to do, God did. Because only the sacrifice that he offered, his only begotten son, could remove sin and give salvation to the lost. So as we close, let me ask you, have you beheld the Lamb? I mean, really looked at him and, and, and understood who he is and what he has done. That he is God's son and our savior. If not in the spirit of John the Baptist, I point you to him. Only he can remove your sin and guilt. And that will happen for you at the moment of faith. What he did on the cross will become a reality for you the moment you believe and forever. May God help you to look to him and spend this next year considering the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your son and sending him into the world. And we thank you that he came as a real man with a true body and a reasonable soul. He was one of us. He is one of us. He's also your eternal son. And because he came and offered himself up in our place as our substitute, his death covers and removes an infinite number of sins. And it obtains salvation for us. We look to him as the Savior. And we thank you. What we have, we've received as a free gift. May we understand the greatness of your grace and be moved to live lives in this coming year in a way that brings great honor to you. May we be pointers as John was and many others have been. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's stand before we move into the Lord's Supper and sing hymn, hymn number 41 in the Songs of Praise book, Behold the Lamb. Hymn number 41.